So Cory Booker has announced he's running for president in 2020. Um, I'm not surprised by this. You're not surprised by this. Nobody's surprised by this. He's been angling for this for, uh, you know, quite a long time. Um, so let's take a look at his launch ad, and then we'll come back and do what we've been doing with all the candidates, which is give you a pretty solid breakdown of his record. In America, we have a common pain, but what we're lacking is a sense of common purpose. What's up? I grew up knowing that the only way we can make change is when people come together. When I was a baby, my parents tried to move us into a neighborhood with great public schools, but realtors wouldn't sell us a home because of the color of our skin. A group of white lawyers who had watched the courage of civil rights activists were inspired to help black families in their own community, including mine. And they changed the course of my entire life. Because in America, courage is contagious. My dad told me, boy, never forget where you came from or how many people had to sacrifice to get you where you are. So over 20 years ago, I moved into the central ward of Newark to fight slumlords and help families stay in their homes. I still live there today and I'm the only senator who goes home to a low income inner city community, the first community that took a chance on me. We are better when we help each other. The history of our nation is defined by collective action, by interwoven destinies of slaves and abolitionists, of those born here and those who chose America as home, those who took up arms to defend our country, and those who linked arms to challenge and change it. I believe that we can build a country where no one is forgotten, no one is left behind where parents can put food on the table, where there are good paying jobs with good benefits in every neighborhood, where our criminal justice system keeps us safe instead of shuffling more children into cages and coffins, where we see the faces of our leaders on television and feel pride, not shame. It is not a matter of can we, it's a matter of do we have the collective will the American will, I believe we do. Together, we will channel our common pain back into our common purpose. Together, America, we will rise. I'm Cory Booker, and I'm running for president of the United States of America. Okay, so um, let me tell you why that wasn't a great ad. <laughs> All right, maybe I'm being a little harsh. It could, it, you know, but... Perhaps it's better than you would have expected from Cory Booker. Perhaps you would have expected a worse ad from Cory Booker, given his history. Um, but here's why that ain't going to fly in 2020. Listen, look at the themes in that ad. Common purpose. Come together. We have a common pain. Let's channel that for our common purpose. Uh, let's do this quote together. Um, we will rise. So it's all like, you know, high school uh, football sloganeering, if you will. It's all like, oh, you know, everything could be good for all of us, and we could have good-paying jobs, and we could all hold hands and sing Kumbaya, and we could all make America united again. Here's the problem with that. What the Democrats need to be running on in 2020 is class warfare. Now, some people might hear that on the right and go, oh my god, is he, did he just come out and say that? Well, here's the reality, guys. We didn't start it. <laughs> like the song goes, we didn't start the fire. The class war was waged from the top 1%, or maybe even the top 0.01%, the ownership class, on the rest of us. And they've been waging that class war for decades. So, they've been coming after us. And wages have been stagnant since the late 1970s, early 1980s. And you know the statistics, because we say them all the time on the show. 76% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Half of workers in America make $30,000 a year or less. 29 million Americans uh, don't have health insurance. 32 to 45,000 Americans die every year because they don't have access to basic health care. So in a system that's that fundamentally broken, you don't get to run on Kumbaya. You can run on Kumbaya if the system wasn't broken, and if there wasn't this, you know, runaway wealth of the top 0.01% in the elite and billionaire class, it's uh, corrupting our entire system thoroughly. If that wasn't the case, you could run on a Kumbaya. Like, if you're running a Kumbaya-type campaign and you're in Sweden, I get it. Because you already have a system that's functioning relatively well. But you're in the U.S. Our system is broken as fuck. Save your kumbaya. I got no, I, I got no use for your kumbaya. 
What I have use for is, we're going to fight back against the billionaires. That's why Elizabeth Warren's ad was good. Now, to be fair to all these guys, nobody to this point has brought up policy substance in their ads. Nobody has. The one that came the closest was uh, Elizabeth Warren. And in hers, it, it's be the reason why it was good is because it touched on these like class warfare themes um, as she did not discuss policy, but... Apparently, they're all making a decision to not bring a policy, but if you're not going to bring a policy, okay, well, then you have to, uh, you know, go to the class war themes and go to, here are the bad guys, it's the billionaires, it's the corporations, it's the elites, it's the people who rigged the system against you, here are the good guys, the people, and working people are going to rise up, and I'm going to be the leader of those working people. That's what you got to run on. Now, again, Cory Booker, even though he added some slight populist themes here and there, the reality is he's running a 1990s style campaign, you just heard it. You know, common purpose, come together. If only somebody had just tried a, a, a campaign with come together as their slogan. Oh, that's right. You had Hillary and it was stronger together. So this is, that, that's not an accident. Like, that's, that's what's going to lose. So I see where he's trying to go with it, but it's just wildly out of step with the times. Now, let's get into uh, his record. The first thing I always think of when I think of Cory Booker it, honestly, it's going back to maybe five to even ten years ago, probably closer to ten, to be honest, where he used to regularly appear on Bill Maher's show uh, on HBO, Real Time with Bill Maher. Now, the thing that always stuck out to me about him was how weaselly he was. Now, why do I say that? Because every single time Bill or anybody else on the panel made a point as if to say, holy shit, these Republicans are dead wrong on this issue, and the Democrats are, need to fight for the right thing. He would always go into his song and dance of, well, you know, hey, there's good people on both sides, and we need to come together, and we need to find the center, and we need to find the middle. And Cory Booker made a point his entire career of being like the old-school Obama uniter character on steroids. He, he made a point of always being the last Democrat to say, you know what, I condemn the Republicans and what they're trying to do with issue X, Y, or Z. He always made a point of being like, I'm, I'm the above the fray guy, I'm the middle of the road guy. He took this Bill Clinton philosophy, this new Democrat philosophy, the triangulation philosophy is the actual political science term, and he said, I am never deviating from this. And he stuck to that come hell or high water for the longest time possible until it was not politically feasible anymore, and he realized he didn't have a choice but to try to pretend to be further left than he is. So he always would do the song and dance of, oh, the center is the best, and I'm in the middle, and I think everybody's got good ideas, and blah, 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 blah. Just political fucking vomit is what it was. Overly calculated garbage that's lazy because it, it assumes that the system we have in Washington, D.C., you have two equal sides pushing for what's best for the American people. Whereas, instead, we have two sides where neither one of them are really pushing for what's good for the American people. So when you're finding the middle point between a corrupt and broken system, you know what that makes you? Corrupt and broken. That's what it makes you. So, uh, now here's his record. Let me go, I'll go to the good stuff. There is, of course, some good stuff. All these Democrats have, uh, you know, some good stuff in their record. So, um, he's good on social issues. He's good on civil rights. He's good on LGBTQ issues. He's good on criminal justice reform. Um, he supports paid family leave, which is wonderful. He says, he says, asterisk by this one, he's for Medicare for all. Um, but he also said just last year, or no, I'm sorry, two years ago, 2017, quote, um, it's okay to look at sing single payer, but I'm not for it. That was just two years ago. Now he says he's for it. Again, probably because he sees where the political winds are going and he knows he can't go against that. So he's kind of kowtowing to that, if you will. Now here's the bad. His entire career, he's been a neoliberal. You know, I just explained, uh, the first thing I think of is his appearances on Bill Maher, and he made crystal clear that he planted his flag in that position. That's who I am. Um, now, in 2014, he supported lower corporate taxes. Listen, you, when you go through the records of a lot of these um, Democrats who are running in 2020, sometimes you're surprised at just how terrible their records are. I was surprised by Kamala's record. There was a lot of stuff. I mean, her stuff as a prosecutor, oh, goodness gracious, what are you doing? For civil asset forfeiture? Excuse you? What? There are some things that are just like, holy shit, this is crazy. 
Cory Booker's got a lot of those holy shit things. So, supported lowering corporate taxes, simply a right-wing position. Um, there was a scandal when in uh, the Obama years, I think it was in 2012, it, when it was Obama versus Romney, Obama had used some attacks against Mitt Romney where he brought up uh, private equity and Bain Capital. Because Bain Capital harvested companies and then fucking laid off uh, working people and then uh, turned around and made a profit. So Obama was like, hey, that's kind of fucked up. What are you doing? <laughs> and Cory Booker went on the Sunday shows and uh, he called Obama's attacks on private equity, quote, nauseating. Now, why is that? Because Cory Booker is one of the Democrats that takes the most amount of money from Wall Street. Cory Booker is also one of the Democrats that takes the most amount of money from Big Pharma. A lot of the pharmaceutical companies are stationed in New Jersey, probably for a tax situation. So this is who he is. Now, uh, he also said, he went out of his way to say, corporate campaign donors helped rebuild Newark. So whenever people brought up to him, hey man, like you take a lot of uh, corporate money, what's going on here? He says, well, listen, they helped rebuild my hometown in Newark. So corporate campaign donors, I'm not against them. I mean, look, they helps. What am I going to say? Um, when you go to his record on Open Secrets, only 12% of his money, 12% comes from small donors. 68% from large donors. So that's that big money bundling that we always talk about, which is the second worst form of corruption. The number one worst form of corruption is corporate PACs. And 10% of his money comes from corporate PACs. Um, and then he famously, famously opposed Bernie's drug reimportation bill. Remember that? That was quite a debacle. And I've never seen a politician become more of a politician than in his response to what happened there. So he sided with Republicans to kill Bernie Sanders' drug reimportation bill. Basically, all of Twitter in unison dunked on him and said, fuck you, you corporate sellout shill doing the bidding of Big Pharma. We see you're one of the top recipients of, uh, literally the top recipient of Big Pharma money, you know, you're canceled, you're done, we hate you, blah, blah, blah. And then he did a 180, and he was like, uh, but, uh, no, see, the problem with Bernie's bill, bro, is that it didn't have, you know, FDA regulation of those drugs, and I can't have unregulated drugs coming in the country, bro. So me, I'm going to propose, uh, here, I'm proposing my own bill that is the same as Bernie's plus FDA regulation. Now, why was that a bullshit dodge? It was a bullshit dodge because there's no epidemic in Canada of the, the drugs making them drop dead. In fact, Canada has stricter regulatory bodies than we do. So, and, and it's also the same drugs, by the way. A lot of this is made by U.S. pharmaceutical companies, and they import them into Canada, and then, you know, they're cheaper in Canada. So, the idea of like, oh my god, they're unregulated. The drugs are not unregulated. They're perfectly regulated. It's just you needed to find a way to weasel out of being against cheaper drugs. So you use that as the thing that you could cling to. Oh, it was, it was just because the FDA regulation issue wasn't there. And I mean, what am I going to do? I got to have safe drugs in the country. As if like, you know, people are dropping dead every day from tainted medication in, in Canada. No, their regulations are better than ours. So it was bullshit. It was a way to, to weasel out of it, wiggle out of it. So uh, everybody, nobody fell for his nonsense. Um... But he did the 180 because he realized my 2020 chances are done if I don't do something about this. So that's what he did. He, he proposed his own bill with the FDA regulation part of it and act like the entire time. He's a liar, by the way, because that's not true. But he sticks to that line. Oh, no, it's just because the FDA regulation. Um, and then finally, he said all options are on the table with Iran. So that means military, including military. He also said we should, quote, hold Assad accountable and is open to military intervention in Syria. So on foreign policy, he's a mess. Oh, Israel. He's horrendous on the issue of Israel, you know. Um, and he's big on this, like, self-help guru hacky shit. Like, he'll, he tweets these really weird, like, self-help promotional, almost Deepak Chopra-like stuff. And it's just really cringy. And that annoys the shit out of me also. Um, and then he did, for, for this race, he did come out with some new ideas. He's trying to find a way to, like, get ahead of, um, or, or get, you know, somehow get his name above the other candidates in the field. So he came out with this idea of baby bonds. I guess every baby gets a bond, and it's a way to try to, um, 
give them a head start so they're not stuck uh, way behind financially. I don't know the specifics of that deal. I've never seen a thorough, um, I've never seen a, a critical analysis of that idea. So I can't comment as to whether or not I like it or don't like it. It's possible it's a good idea. Um, but overall, Cory Booker is heavily in the camp of corporate Democrat, in my opinion. So, you know, you have this spectrum, and on that spectrum, you have politicians who are social democratic or populist left and who mean it, you know, Bernie being the gold standard on that front, I guess you could say. Um, and then you have, you know, people that lean to different sides of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, you have Cory Booker. He's the prime example of the corporate Democrat who will not change much and who will give us, at best, by the way, at best, he would give us the kind of change Obama gave us. But that's really being too kind to Cory Booker because there's a lot of stuff Obama did that I don't think Cory Booker would have done. So I think it's fair to say Obama is actually to the left of Cory Booker on the political spectrum, even though he's a very st kind of standard, um, you know, centristy type Democrat. So he's not good. <laughs> I will not be supporting Cory Booker in 2020. Um, but there you go. There's... There's Cory Booker's announcement for 2020, and I still want more corporate Democrats to jump in the race, so they split that vote more. I'm waiting for it. Keep jumping in. But we actually have a story later that's a little concerning on that front. A bunch of them are like, I don't know if I'm going to run now because they see the reaction to Howard Schultz. So this is, this is fascinating, but I need more corporate Democrats to jump in. So I welcome Cory Booker to the race, even though I will not be supporting him.